Twitter CEO Elon Musk says cancel culture is over as a result of his takeover of Twitter, tweeting, rip cancel culture, you won't be missed. Meanwhile, elsewhere on the culture war front, the CEO of Anti-Woke Inc. has his eyes on the presidency, according to new reporting from Politico. Biotech founder and rising political star Vivek Ramaswamy has gained attention for his disdain for identity politics and virtue signaling on the left. Welcome, Vivek. Good to see you guys. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for joining us. So obviously, this was some big news in Politico that you're planning to run for president. Uh, you're not someone currently in political office, and you're not someone, I think, with huge rec name recognition outside of conservative media. But I'm very interested to have you talk to us about why you decided to run for president and you know what you're hoping to do in terms of talking about solutions to the problems I know you speak a lot about in terms of identity politics, uh, wokeness, ESG, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm strongly considering a run. I've been actually very transparent about that. I expect to make a decision in the relative near term. But to me, this is less a question about the who, okay? I think we obsess over that sometimes too much. It's a question about the what and the why. What agenda do we stand for and why do we stand for it? And I say this as a first-generation American myself, I have criticized this woke infection in every sphere of our lives. I've written a couple of books. I've fought against the ESG cancer, including through the market over the last year by starting a new firm. But I've, I've really concluded that the real problem is upstream. Our generation, our nation, is so hungry for a cause. We're hungry for purpose and meaning and identity. At a moment in our national history when the things that used to fill that void, like faith or patriotism or even hard work, have disappeared. And I think it's an opportunity for the conservative movement to fill that void with something so meaningful that it dilutes this woke culture to irrelevance. Why do we see the rise of transgenderism or climatism or COVIDism? It's because it fills that vacuum of identity at the heart of the American soul. And that's actually how you solve this, not by playing whack-a-mole one at a time, not just by criticizing the other side, though it is important to see the problem with clear eyes, but to fill that vacuum with a sense of American purpose and identity that is so meaningful that it can dilute the poison to irrelevance. And to the extent I'm considering doing this, that would be why I'd be on this mission. Vivek, help me understand why you see wokeism as the core issue here, or at least a core symptom of what you've described as a, as a, as a central issue, which is a lack of emphasis uh, on hard work or some of these other qualities. You know, when I look around the country, what I hear a lot, um, what I think I heard a lot in the context of the Bernie campaign, which obviously galvanized a lot of people, was that they're working very, very hard, but the returns on their work are not what they were 20, 30, 50 years ago, that the piece of the pie that workers get for their labor is smaller at the same time that corporations and extractive companies like hedge funds and venture capital have taken more and more of their paycheck at the same time that their dollar goes less and less far, paying for things like food and health care and education. And you see in even Republican strongholds like in Florida, they voted in 2020 to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which to me is an evidence of a country that says, I don't like to work hard, is evidence of a country and, and Americans who are saying, we're not getting paid the value of their work. So what do you say to people who are focused on those kind of core economic concerns and frustrated that both Republicans and Democrats do, I think, at many times, at many points, like to focus on identity, Republicans talking about wokeism, Democrats putting rainbow flags on missiles, et cetera, instead of actually delivering economically for the American people? I want to make an observation. I think you actually made some pretty good points there. The old left, the pre-2008 left, used to be concerned about economic injustice and even issues like poverty and economic mobility. And unfortunately, what happened in the back of the 2008 financial crisis is after the bailouts, and I'm very critical of the Republican administration, I was critical at the time, I'm critical today, that effectuated those bailouts, the Bush administration. On the back of those bailouts, I think you have a lot of people on the left and even some on the right who said, that's just crony capitalism. That's a broken system where bankers made a lot of money when times were good. Now they get bailed out by the public fisc when times get bad. Then we need to at least redistribute money from those wealthy corporate fat cats to poor people. But what happened was the rise of this woke movement actually allowed the corporations in this country to deflect accountability by marrying this new woke left that preaches about climatism and racism and misogyny and bigotry. So I view that as an artificial debate. So in many ways, I actually agree with what you said. Now, I don't think that my focus on the woke infection is a focus on identitarianism because I want to get rid of identitarianism so that we can go back 
to actually debating the real issues of how we can prosper and move forward as a country. But in order to do that, we have to take on and dismantle these toxic ideologies that now are getting ossified in the next generation of Americans, teaching them it, that you, your identity is the color of your skin, not the content of your character. So that's what moves me. You know, is taking on those ideologies, and I, so I've been critical of a lot of the same things you're critical of and you're talking about. I think the difficulty becomes, you know, what is the solution, especially for Republicans who I think rightly so in the past, you know, are, are, are critical of government involvement, et cetera, but, but now are saying, well, the decisions being made by companies like Disney and Netflix, et cetera, we don't like them, but how do we, you know, how do we, Pur you said purge this toxic ideology. Does that take, you know, government involvement in a way that then, well, what you know, the Republican Party is violating all of its prior notions on this, on 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 what what government powers relationship to private industry should be. Great question. So I think that there's a lot of nuance here. I've said the Republican Party needs to stop reciting slogans they memorized back in 1980 and wake up to the real threats to liberty and prosperity today. One of the policies I've advocated for, for example is making political expression a civil right in this country. I don't care if you're on the left or the right, you should not have to choose between putting food on the dinner table and speaking your mind freely. America is the quintessential nation where you get to enjoy both of those things at once. Getting rid of race-based affirmative action programs, not just in college admissions, but in other spheres of life. Now, what are one of the counter arguments you hear? Well, you hear legacy admissions, right? If, you, if your parents or grandparents went to Harvard, you have a better chance of getting in. I'd say get rid of those too. So that's a valid counter argument that actually Republicans need to get off their high horse and wake up to the fact that if we wanna apply meritocracy, let's actually have a meritocracy in this country. That's something that I happen to favor. I say, you know what? More people like my parents who came to this country through the front door legally, raised a family, had two kids who went on to start companies that helped thousands of people. Great, we should want more immigrants like them. Be open about that. But that means unapologetically securing the border and saying that people whose first act of entering this country is a law-breaking one should not be able to come to this country full stop. So I, I think that there is room for actually looking at a lot of solutions here. I think one of the big problems in the next generation of Americans is the rise of addictive social media. I think if you can't smoke an addictive cigarette by the age of 18, I don't think you should be able to use an addictive social media product by the age of 15 or 16 either. And that's not a partisan point. So my main message is we need to wake up to the unique challenges of today. It is not 1980 anymore. As Abraham Lincoln said, the dogmas of a quiet past, as I often quote, are inadequate to the stormy present. Let's wake up to the present and address those problems. I'm right there with you. Vic, you said a, you've said a lot there um, to get back into. One, I'm curious. One, I'm curious whether or not you don't whether you don't see the First Amendment as protecting the kinds of political speech that you would like to have a specific bill or constitutional amendment, it's not, it's not clear to me um, yeah. I'll be to clear protect. For you. But also, uh, so a couple of other points, I, if I could just get in there. Uh, you would want to ban social media, are there other kind of addictive behaviors that you would like to ban? Would you ban marijuana? Would you ban uh, cigarettes? Would you ban fast food? Would you ban soda? Because um, I think there are some very libertarian-minded people in our audience that would be really skeptical of some of those policies. Yep. And lastly, you have referenced a couple of times climatism and genderism. And I want to uh, clarify, I believe you're a biology major at Harvard. Do you, you know, I understand that biology is, uh, biology is not climate science, but do you not believe in global warming? Do you think that a transition to clean technologies is or is not a problem? Um, you want to, uh, uh, you know, get rid of some of what you've described as wokeism, but I wonder what you have to say to people like my family who are not recent immigrants, but who, you know, all of my aunts and uncles on my father's side graduated from segregated schools, um, are, were not born with civil rights in this country, are very new in our ability to access the American dream that your parents were able to access when they first immigrated to this country. And what do you say to folks that see and your attack on wokeism, an attack on the very um, uh, civil rights legacy that enabled your parents to have rights when they came to this country? A lot of great questions embedded in there. Let me hit as many of them as I can, starting with the last one. I actually think the Republican Party should be the party that embraces not just the identity of being the party of Lincoln, as it was, but even the party of MLK's message, that you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character. And one of the things that bothers me is this new wave of anti-black racism that we are seeing in America, 
And I think there's no better way to cause racism against a racial group than by creating structures that create the perception, and in some cases the reality, of losing your seat in college or your job or your chance at a promotion because of the color of your skin. So it's not just anti-white and anti-Asian racism that bothers me, but also bluntly condescension that that creates and animus that that creates towards black and Hispanic colleagues in the workplace or classmates in school. But the thing, now, let me, people work, are concerned let me, about- You asked a lot of questions, but okay. yeah, I can address the others too, if you'd like. I can quickly address the others and then, and then we can go wherever you'd sure. like. Sure. You, so many great questions there. Climate, let me just be really clear. I've actually been clear in other forms too. Look, I think that temperatures are likely going up. They're likely going up due to man-made causes. However, the actual best way to protect against the effects of climate change isn't through abandoning fossil fuels. It is through more fossil fuel usage. That's a blunt reality where you look at the number of people who die of climate-related disasters today. For every 100 that died in 1922, die today. That's a 98% reduction. And that's driven by advances powered by fossil fuels. And so I think that, yes, you got to see the facts with clear eyes, but you can't approach them with the religious zealotry that causes you to only adopt one set of behaviors that actually are even self-defeating. For example, the hostility towards nuclear energy in the climate movement, or even the, the fact that they're fine with shifting production to places like China and Russia where methane leakage is far worse, and methane is work, worse for global warming than carbon dioxide, actually reveals that this agenda isn't about the climate. It's about a religious zealotry that's grounded in this vision of equity. And then the last question you asked was, I used to call myself a libertarian, and so uh, you know, I think I still have a lot of libertarian instincts still left in me. What's going on there with big tech censorship? Shouldn't companies actually still be allowed to decide what does and doesn't show up on their websites, for example? Well, you know what? I don't call it big tech censorship anymore. I call it what it is, government tech censorship. Because what we see today is the government is using these companies. It's pressuring them through threats, giving them special inducements, like Section 230C2, among others, to do through the back door what government could not do through the front door under the Constitution. And I say that if it is state action in disguise, then the Constitution still applies. These companies ought to be bound by the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States if they're working hand in glove with the government, protected by the government, to do what the government could not do directly. And you're right, these are complex issues. And so I'm not here to recite some sort of Friedmanite slogans that I'm trying to retrofit the present reality into. To the contrary, part of the reason to the extent I did do this, you know, a presidential run or otherwise, is waking up to the fact that these new realities demand new dogmas, demand new principles. And that's a big part of what I'd like to be a part of, of shaping the dialogue. Uh, there's a, a lot more we'd like to get into with you, Vivek. So maybe we'll have you back. Uh, very interesting stuff. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. More Rising right after this.